Oh, sorry, it's always been a great pleasure to be here. And uh, so t today I'm going to talk uh, about ADHD and substance use disorder. And uh, I'm doing the introduction, and then uh, uh, Maurice is going to do the real topic. So I'm the uh, amuser for today. Uh, so before I go, I have to make some disclosures. I don't think I have a lot of disclosures for this specific uh, meeting, but you should know that uh, a long time ago I was uh, doing some work for Pfizer. Uh, but for the rest, I think most of my activities with pharma industry is not related to ADHD and substance abuse. So in this, uh, in this session, I will talk a little bit about the epidemiology of the comorbidity of ADHD and substance use disorders. And following from that, I want to talk briefly on the possible prevention of substance use disorder in patients and children with ADHD. Then shortly talk about the model for ADHD and substance use disorder genetics and, and neurobiology. And then, of course, the, the most important part is going to be uh, done by uh, Maurice de Matis and then finally some, some conclusions. With regard to the epidemiology, some almost 10 years ago, we did a meta-analysis. I think since then it's being cited quite a lot. And uh, it was quite shocking uh, for us uh, to, to see that if you look at uh, uh, both adolescents and adult patients in, in addiction treatment centers, about a quarter of them actually met criteria for adult ADHD. Uh, if you look through the studies, there was a big range so it was from 10 to 55, 54%. And so you have to question why is that? Is it a question of the, the kind of treatment setting that you're going through? But overall, it was uh, about a quarter of the patients. Uh, the, the, another question is how many of the kids that have ADHD develop a substance use disorder? And this was one of the early studies from the United States. And what you see is it's a follow-up study, a cohort study. 176 patient children between the ages of 6 and 12 years. They were treated with methylphenidate, so you could have an indication that it's probably the more severe ADHD kids. And they were followed up for, uh, for about 12 years. And at the age of around 20, 45% actually met criteria for an alcohol use disorder or a drug use disorder. So half of the patients with childhood ADHD who were in treatment developed an addiction, which is, I thought, quite shocking. It's a huge risk, and we have to start to understand that. And of course, they looked at predictors, which I come back later. Uh, if you look to the general population, you see the same picture. This was a study of 2007, looking in different countries. Let me see whether I can also have different countries. And you see, uh, overall, the... Uh, Prevalence was about, for adult age, was 3.4%. But in subjects in the general population with an addiction, this ADHD prevalence was 12.5%, meaning a risk of closer, like this. Sounds very loud. Uh, and as you might expect, most of them started with ADHD and then developed uh, the, uh, the substance use disorder. At that time, in, to, in 2007, only 13% uh, of these patients were treated with, uh, with stimulants in the US and 0% in the rest of the world. Now, this might have changed slightly, but uh, we will hear whether it's really changed uh, a lot. This was, uh, of course, this was a, a cross-sectional study. These are prospective cohort studies, and they were looking at the risk of uh, of, ADHD, of substance use disorder in children with ADHD. And again, in any of these studies, you saw that uh, uh, the risk was uh, 1.5 to 3.5 higher in children with ADHD compared to children without ADHD. And this is a recent, relatively recent review from predictors of uh, substance use disorders. And you see that ADHD is among the highest predictors, which you see odds ratio bef between two and three, if you go to conduct disorders, which are often comorbid with ADHD, you see you go to odds ratios up to, to four. And here you see a little bit about the certainty that we have, and we are absolutely certain that these are 
very reasonable figures. So the question is, of course, is ADHD causing substance use disorder, or is it more complicated? And of course, you can think that certain genetic factors and environmental factors can either cause ADHD or they can cause, can, can cause substance use disorder, or they can, use, they can cause both of these disorders. But what I assumed here in the beginning is that there is a direct relation between ADHD and substance use disorder. Now, there have been people who are saying, this is probably not the case. It's only the patients that have ADHD and a comorbid conduct disorder, and they develop substance use disorder. So that's been a discussion. Uh, and there is definitely some truth. This is a, a pretty old study, 2009, looking uh, at al alcohol dependence in, uh, in, in patients that uh, were seen before. And what you see then is that uh, if you have neither, you have neither ADHD or conduct disorder, then the probability that you develop an alcohol dependence is pretty low, 7%. If you have only ADHD, then the probability is 12%. If you have only conduct disorder, it's 27%. And if you have both disorders, it's much higher. So you see ADHD in and by itself has an effect on uh, the development of substance use disorder, but that gets hard, very strongly increased if you go to patients who have both ADHD and conduct disorder. Uh, this is a more recent study from, uh, from the Netherlands, and here basically the same uh, picture. Here you see uh, the development of uh, alcohol use disorder or uh, drug use disorders. Here is patients with uh, uh, healthy controls compared to ADHD and ODD. You see there is no difference. Here's the ADD, ADHD patients, highly increased probability of developing uh, uh, alcohol use disorders, and here is, of course, if you have ADHD plus conduct disorders, your probability is the highest that you develop a substance use disorder. For nicotine dependence, uh, it's a little bit the same, but you see here again that the biggest risk is for ADHD and conduct disorder. Now, a good question if is this relationship with, between ADHD and substance use disorder is causal, then if you take away the causal factor, the ADHD, you may prevent the development of substance use disorder. So that is what has been studied quite a lot. And you start to think about, could we prevent the development of substance use disorder in patients with ADHD? So, can we do this? Let's see. So this was the study that I showed you before, that half of the patients in this follow-up study of 12 years, they developed uh, uh, an alcohol use disorder and or a drug use disorder. And they looked at the predictors of developing this substance use disorder in these ADHD kids. And they looked at many factors, but they found only one predictive factor, and that was actually starting the, 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 the methylphenidate treatment. And the sooner these patients started with methylphenidate, the lower was the probability that they developed a substance use disorder. Uh, after that, there were many other uh, studies that were done, and this was a meta-analysis, and I don't know what you think about meta-analysis. Yeah, there are good meta-analysis, but there are also bad meta-analysis. And actually, there are also bad meta-analysis because the interpretation is too simplistic, and this is one of them. So this was... The question was, does stimulant treatment in childhood ADHD result in more or less addiction? And so they had 15 longitudinal studies, including more than 2,500 patients. And the conclusion was, there's no effect of stimulant treatment on the risk of developing addiction. This is what the data were. And if I read these data, and you can see this, you see some studies, they show a higher risk for developing substance use disorder if you use uh, stimulants. Other studies use, show that they have a lower probability. This number, the overall number, doesn't mean anything. You have to analyze why they find something in some study and something else in other studies. So I think this conclusion of this metal analysis is quite useless. For example, they didn't look at the percentage of patients in the studies that actually were using uh, these uh, stimulants. They didn't look at comorbidity with conduct disorders. 
uh, they didn't look at ADHD severity. So it's very likely if you have a more severe disorder that you get more, have a bigger probability that you get uh, stimulant medication. And if there's then no difference, my God, that shows that it actually is maybe beneficial to take stimulants. It was not the last answer. There were more treatments, uh, studies. This is a study from the Netherlands again, uh, showing very clearly that uh, if you're a patient with ADHD uh, using stimulants, that your risk of substance use disorder actually normalizes. It's not higher than ADHD patients that do not... Uh, uh, that, that here you see the, the ones that have no stimulant use, and you see uh, by the age of 17, 18, about 25% has a substance use disorder. If they use a stimulant, they see they get, get down to about 12%, a big reduction. Not a very nice effect, no, no effect actually on, on nicotine dependence. Moreover, it was found that the effect of stimulant use as a child was larger if the stimulant treatment was started at a younger age. Finally, I think there is a very interesting study that came out about a year and a half ago. And here what you see is actually a study with uh, about 300 ADHD participants. Age ba at baseline, they were 12 years old and they were followed up for four years until age 16 and healthy controls, so same follow-up period. And they were looking at what kind of medication they got. And so there were patients uh, that started with medications relatively late, on the average at the age of 11, and they got moderate high doses of methylphenidate, 24 milligrams on average. There were a group of patients that were early starters with medication, but used only a moderate dose. And there were early starters with an intensive dose of 53 milligrams. And of course, there was a group that used no stimulants. And so was the... Was the uh, development of substance use disorder. And that's what you see here, very impressive data. If you use no, if you had ADHD and you use no stimulants, you see the risk of developing substance use disorder is about 30%. If you use stimulants, but only moderate dosages, whether you started late or early, you see there's a reduction of your risk of substance use disorder, but only if you use, start early using the stimulant and you do high doses, then you reduce the, uh, the, the risk of, of, of substance use disorder to what is here, something like 10%. So the best outcomes you have with children with ADHD, they started to use stimulants around age six, seven, eight, and having decent dosages, adequate dosages of uh, methylphenidate. And here you see again on nicotine dependence, the same kind of effect, but here also the only uh, predictor is early use, whether it's high or low doses of stimulants. So there is also, you might say this is all naturalistic studies. We want to have a randomized control trial to believe you. So don't believe me. They're never going to come. There's not going to be studies that will start at age seven or eight, and that will follow patients until age 18 or 20. Not randomized controlled trials. And if they come, they're likely to fail these trials. It's just not possible to do the randomized controlled trials over a period of 10, 12 years. So you start to think, is this enough to have these data from cohort studies? There's another interesting way to look at it, and that is then you have to go, of course, to Scandinavia because they keep all the records. And this is a, uh, a uh, uh, register study, uh, including 28,000, uh, 29,000 uh, uh, Scandinavian, Swedish uh, patients that were ever in treatment. Uh, and what you see, uh, and it's a complicated table, but what the register studies show that if you look at the uh, ADHD, ADHD children that were ever in treated and ended up for substance abuse treatment, that went down with 70% if they used stimulants before age 15. So they don't know exactly how young they were, but it went down with 70% uh, after they, uh, if they used uh, methylphenidate. Now people say it's dangerous. It's dangerous to give 
to young patients to give them methylphenidate or other stimulants. And, uh, yeah, you have to think about that. It's, a, it's an important issue. This is some of the data that, uh, that you can find in the literature. And this is probably the most important part of that, that slide. What you see is here, it's a comparison of the, uh, the volume of the basal ganglia in patients with uh, ADHD. If you give them methylphenidate or another stimulant, what you see is uh, this is different samples. Every bullet is a different uh, uh, sample of patients. The more patients with ADHD that were treated with the stimulants, the closer they come to a normal, this is a normal 0.0, .0 to a normal volume of the uh, basal ganglia. So it seems that methylphenidate is actually uh, stimulating the maturation of the brain in the sense that actually they reach normal sizes of their basic ganglia. Uh, of course, there is also always issues about safety if you start to treat children with, uh, with stimulants. And this is a very nice review and basically it tells you a lot, but one of the most important issues that uh, most studies suggest that uh, brain structure and brain function improvement in the course of and following stimulant treatment in patients with ADHD. So I think it's reassuring that uh, this can do, be done. So this is a very strong uh, position that I take that if you have a child with ADHD and he doesn't respond or she doesn't respond well to any kind of non-medical treatment, please consider treatment with a stimulant. Please consider it as a, at a young age Please consider to give him or her adequate dosages because you might prevent the development of, of uh, serious substance use disorders. So I'm sure that this is a debated issue, but uh, I think this is what the data tell us. And if you want to wait for randomized controlled trials to prove this, you wait for nothing. So it's a strong recommendation here. Now, how can you imagine that substance use disorder and ADHD go together so often? So this is theoretically the possible ways. It could be that substance use disorders by themselves make people restless and develop a, uh, ADHD. It's not very likely because ADHD most of the time precedes the development of uh, substance use disorders. Although there are some discussions about de novo uh, adult ADHD. I, I think these data are not very strong, but I think it is the probability that you start with an addiction and then develop ADHD is actually pretty small. It's more likely that you have ADHD and that you do develop a substance use disorder. For example, because you use stimulants or you start to use stimulants and you think, oh, it improves my, uh, my uh, uh, ADHD symptoms. Which would mean that most of the addictions in ADHD patients would be stimulant addictions, which is definitely not the case. We see all different addictions with patients with ADHD. You could think that, okay, it can be because they use cannabis to sleep better. It's possible. The most likely explanation is that these disorders come together so often is because they share both genetic predispositions and they share environmental factors. And so that's why they co-occur together at different stages of their life. They start with ADHD, because of certain genetic predispositions and environmental factor, and in the course of their ADHD, for the same reasons, they develop a substance use disorder. And the others are probably less important. Now, it can be a little bit more complex. It can be that ADHD is causing depressive, major depressive disorder, and the depressive disorder is making people use stimulants because maybe it relieves some of the depression or they start to use alcohol to relieve some of the sleeping problems. It is all possible. This is what, uh, it's a beautiful review, a beautiful report from Molina and Palam in 2014, and they make an inventory of all the possible mechanisms that might be involved of ADHD patients developing a substance use disorder. You, you can read it all. They also made a picture of that, and this is how it goes, like they say. Uh, it starts in uh, 
pregnancy, then it goes to childhood, adolescence, and adolescence at all. And say, of course, it starts with neurobiology, and there might be an overlap of the basic neurobiology in addiction and in ADHD. But then they develop all kinds of problems. ADHD patients develop academic failures, social difficulties, conduct problems. And from there, they start to have affiliation with peers. They use substances, and they get in environmental places where the norms are different, and so they develop a substance use disorder. So this could all be possible. I, I have some doubts by the, with this model, and I'll show you why. Uh, I, I'll leave this. So this is what this model, a little simplifies, tells you, that this all can happen. It could, it could be. It could be genes, environment, self-medication, thrill-seeking, social problems. It could all be. But then I started to look at the genetics of these two disorders. And so what you see if you look at family, the, the most simple uh, studies for fam family relationship or the poor man's genetics. And so if you look at that, here is parental uh, alcohol dependence, and definitely their children also have a higher risk to be alcohol dependent. But these kids are also having higher risk of ADHD, ODD, and CD. You see very high risks. The same if you have parents with uh, drug dependence. You see, of course, they have a higher probability. These kids of, uh, of, of drug dependent patients also have a higher probability to become drug dependent themselves. But they also have a much higher probability, odds ratio of four, to become uh, ADHD patients. So it seems that there is something running in the family. Uh, this is one of the first studies that was done on common mental disorders by uh, Kenneth Kendall in 2003. And he looked at the, uh, the different disorders and the genetic background of that. And what you see then is uh, that there is these externalizing disorders. And here you see the, the genetic contribution to that. And you see there's alcohol dependence, there is drug abuse and dependence, there is antisocial behavior, and there's conduct disorders they all share a lot of genetic variability with each other. So it's not a gene for ADHD or for alcohol dependence. It is uh, genes that are shared by different externalizing disorders uh, together. You say, okay, there is no ADHD. No, in 2003, people didn't in weren't interested in looking at ADHD. If they would have done it, that's my fantasy that ADHD would just be this part of this externalizing disorders. So because we didn't have these data, we did a family study, a twin study, in patients with ADHD, uh, looking at ADHD and alcohol dependence. And what you see is here that the heritability of ADHD, adult ADHD was 38%, the heritability of alcohol use was 50%, the phenotypic correlation between ADHD and uh, alcohol use disorder. So the symptoms that they had, how much they overlap, was about uh, 0.30. And this 0.30 was almost completely explained by genetic factors. Only 9% was explained by non-shared environmental factors. So if you think about that, and okay, there were other studies done uh, showing similar things. This was a study uh, that showed correlations between, genetic correlation between ADHD, or nicotine dependence, alcohol dependence, smoking. Uh, so you see high genetic correlations between uh, ADHD and substance use disorder. This is probably the latest that was done, very famous study in cell, uh, but one problem. They looked at all the disorders, but they forgot substance use disorder. So we decided we do a replication of this study, but we include substance use disorder. And what did we see? That in terms of the genetic variability, ADHD, ADHD was coming up together with substance use disorder, with autism spectrum disorders, and with major depression. Not with psychosis, not with compulsive disorders. So it seems that ADHD and substance use disorders share a lot of genetic vulnerability. And if I start to look, this is actually what's being said in a all the review already that uh, common genetic network underlies the comorbidity of ADHD and, and substance use disorder. So uh, this is a complex model. Uh, and I don't think it's not true, but I think this model is driven 
by shared genes. And of course, there is, uh, and I'm not going to talk for long about it, there is gene environment interactions, and this is some of the examples. So there will be things like going on like this, that the genes together with environmental factors increase the risk of ADHD patients having uh, substance use disorder. But genes are the driving force in all that. And so it means that we have to look at genes-related interventions if we want to, to treat these patients. So you start to think about medication or other kinds of neurobiological treatments. So what are these neurobiological aspects? How much time do I have? OK. So this is a model that we often use when we talk about uh, addiction. It's a model that uh, was stolen with permission from, uh, from uh, Gottesman and Gould, who described the uh, idea of the genotype and the phenotype and phenotype for the first time uh, about schizophrenia in 2003, I think, yeah, 2003. And they said there is people who have certain genes, and uh, here is uh, the chromosomes, and on the chromosomes are these bullets and they're the genes, of course, highly simplified. And if you have certain combination of genes, you might develop, you might be born actually with the endophenotype that is, for example, characterized by disinhibition and conflict monitoring, you can say by impulsivity or by reward deficiency. You need a lot of excitement before you can actually feel pleasure. And that's probably related to the density of the uh, uh, dopamine receptors in the uh, in nucleus accumbens. And so you are born with this kind of setup of brain functions. And then if you start to use drugs also, then it might change and you might develop the phenotype of addiction. And the most prominent aspects of addiction, if you think about the neurobiology, is that patients who develop addiction, they have a hyperactive reward system and they have a deficient control system. And if you think about that, I think about adolescents. Adolescents have a hyperactive reward system. If they go for it, they go for it really. They get easily excited. And they easily do it because they have a deficient control system. It's not developed yet enough. And if you think about adolescents, you also think actually about ADHD patients. You could say they have a postponed maturation. So actually what I think I'm looking, not here about addicts, I'm looking basically at a earlier developmental stage of the addiction. That's actually what you could call uh, 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 ADHD. Now the question if that's really true, but if you think about this disinhibition and reward efficiency and, and excitement, then this is really what you can think. For example, in, uh, in, in patients with an addiction, you see something is what we call delay discounting. They, it's difficult for them to postpone gratification. You can go to this site on, on, and you can see very nicely, no time to, to go into it. Uh, but if you then look at, uh, at, at these are the studies of it, patients with an addiction, and they can't postpone gratification. And how do you see that? That is, the impulsive people have this, this graph all the way to the bottom. So this is controls. They can postpone their gratification. Uh, these are substance use disorder without antisocial personality. This is uh, substance use disorder with antisocial personality. So you see there's a lot of impulsivity there in these uh, addicted patients. Uh, this is the same kind of uh, test that they do in ADHD patients, and they have the same thing. They can't postpone gratification. Effect size in this study, slightly differently presented, of D is 0.43, which is a small to moderate effect size. Uh, the same you see here. This is uh, healthy controls again they can postpone gratification. Here you see the ADHD patients, they're not so good in it. And this is ADHD patients with cocaine, they're the worst. So if you have both, you just are just even more impulsive. And the same is for motor impulsivity. There's also something that's called error monitoring. And that's another way of impulsivity. And uh, we know from uh, opiate dependent patients, they have problems with their motor impulsivity. You can't see it so well here, but here you see this, whoop.
you can't see it so well, but here you see a, a red spot. That's the anterior cingulate cortex. So if you uh, see these controls, if you give them a task in which they have to make a choice, they start thinking. Or maybe you should, should say their anterior cingulate cortex is starting to think. And they say, will I have a glass of alcohol now? Or maybe I should have to wait because I still have to work a little bit tonight. So you have to do this kind of a, a balancing of, of ideas. And so that's what's called error monitoring by psychologists, and which is a, a wise thing to do. You see, in opiate addicted patients, don't, they don't get their anterior cingulate cortex to work. We did the similar thing with uh, controls and smokers and gamblers. And what you see is the smokers, if you give them this kind of a task that they have to start to balance pro and con, they activate their anterior cingulate cortex. You see here the anterior cingulate cortex. Smokers, a little less, and here's gamblers, pathological gamblers. So they come into the, uh, the casino, they don't think, they don't balance, they just do, and they lose. And uh, this is ADHD patients. Just going back. One slide, same task that they get. Here you see the normal controls. Here you see the pathological gamblers, no activation. Here's adult normal controls. Here's adult ADHD patients. Normal controls, if they get this task, they activate the anterior cingulate cortex. And here you see nothing happens in the ADHD patients. So again, very similar in their neurobiology. And these were ADHD patients without substance use disorders. So people started to look, can we see differences in neurocognitive tasks? Because I was convinced that they would find that ADHD patients who develop a substance use disorder, 50%, 30 to 50%, they would be more impulsive, even more impulsive than the average ADHD patient. And then, they did all these measures of impulsivity, all like cognitive tasks. They didn't find any predictor of substance use disorder in ADHD patients. Very strange. Maybe they were already so high in impulsivity that there is a ceiling effect. But anyway, they didn't find this. And they concluded that the problem is not in the, what they call, the cold neural uh, factors, but the hot, the reward processing function. Maybe the patients with ADHD that develop an addiction have mainly reward processing problems. But then there were some other studies and didn't look at impulsivity measured by neurocognitive tasks, but by self-report. And as some of you may know, impulsivity is a very complex uh, function. And there's almost no relationship between self-reported impulsivity and impulsivity measured with cognitive tasks. They use self-report and suddenly uh, you see that impulsivity, negative urgency and positive urgency, which means a tendency to act out impulsively after positive or a negative emotions. Suddenly negative urgency and positive emergency, um, urgency are moderators, medi sorry, I have to say mediators of the effect of ADHD in developing uh, substance use disorder. So maybe there is a role for self-reported impulsivity. Uh, here's another study showing basically the same thing. So uh, it's not so simple as we thought before. Reward efficiency. Reward efficiency we see in alcohol and drug dependent patients. And what it means is that they probably have a lower density of dopamine receptors in the, uh, in the uh, basal ganglia in the nucleus accumbens. And that's why they can't uh, uh, perceive uh, pleasure so easily. Uh, it's also called anhedonia or reward deficiency. And you see it very clearly here in, uh, this is uh, com comparison subjects. These are drug abusers, this is cocaine. You see a lot of red here, which means high number of dopamine receptors in the basal ganglia. Here you see the cocaine user, they don't, he doesn't have it. Methamphetamine and alcohol, so maybe this is uh, a factor that's important in development of uh, drug addiction. Uh, the same actually we see in uh, ADHD patients, it's not so clear here, but this is actually, if you compare the uh, findings on the 
neurochemistry of ADG and substance use disorder using either PET or SPEC scans or fMRI, MRS, and as a structural MRI, then you see there is a high overlap between data from uh, uh, substance use disorder patients and ADHD patients, probably with the exception of the uh, uh, MRS, but uh, the data there are also quite weak. So if we think which ADHD patients develop substance use disorder, because again, not all of them develop a substance use disorder, only 30 to 50 percent, but the ones that develop it, it seems most likely that they have problems in their reward processing uh, mechanism. So that is what the conclusion of this review on, on neuroimaging data is. But given the recent date on self-reported impulsivity, I think we cannot exclude that uh, it can also be ADHD patients that are both high in impulsivity and have reward processing problems. So my conclusions for this talk is ADHD and substance use uh, frequently co-occur. Uh, it's uh, anywhere between 10, 15, or 25 percent of treatment-seeking substance use disorder patients have an adult ADHD. Uh, childhood ADHD is a strong predictor of substance use disorders independent of the presence of uh, uh, conduct disorder. Of course, it increases the probability, but it's also an independent risk factor. Early stimulant treatment with adequate dosage uh, in ADHD patients can prevent the development of substance use disorder. It's probably the most clinically relevant statement today for my talk. Common genetic network underlies the, uh, uh, the comorbidity of ADHD and substance use disorder. And that is why I think that the neurobiology of ADHD and substance use is very similar. Uh, with high reward sensitive and deficient cognitive control, uh, and with difference in self-reported impulsivity and reward processing predicting this substance use disorder. And of course, then you're left with the question, okay, it co-occurs, it has underlying neurobiology that is very similar, and it's strongly related to genetic vulnerability, but what does it mean for my treatment? And lucky for you, uh, Maurice de Matis is here, and he's going to uh, deal with the last question. Uh, how do you treat patients who actually develop this comorbidity? And there is quite some new data on that, and I'm sure uh, Maurice is going to join that with you. Perhaps there's some some of you have some questions, but we can deal with these after Maurice has spoken. Or accident. Misunderstanding of the risk of uh, psychotic episodes in the treatment of uh, patients with uh, uh, ADHD medication. I think uh, I fully agree with uh, 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 Maurice that good diagnostics are needed. I think we almost never see any psychotic episodes. And I think the literature is full of it, and probably because of misdiagnosis of ADHD instead being a, a bipolar disorder. So I think it's more a diagnostic issue than a side effect uh, issue. With regard to the dosing, I'm not saying that in all patients with ADHD and substance use disorders, you have to go to higher doses. What I do say, though, is if you want to treat these patients, you have to be willing to go to doses higher than the standard medication. Because uh, one, and you refer to one of our studies where we showed that uh, uh, the same doses of methylphenidate in this case, uh, long-acting methylphenidate, in patients with ADHD compared to patients with ADHD and cocaine use disorder, just the binding to the uh, dopamine uh, transporter was much lower in the comorbid uh, population. So indicating that just to have the same level of occupation of the dopamine transporter, which you actually want with your methylphenidate, you just need higher dosage to, to, to reach that. But it's not in all patients, so I would say start with normal dosing, but be aware that it might not be enough, and be led by your patients in, in the reports and, and, and his family in reports of how he's doing. 
And if you have to go to 180 milligrams, I think there's definitely no, no problem. We go higher. We go to 240 milligrams if needed. And of course, then you have to start looking at abuse, which we hardly see in these patients. But be, I would say be clear about it with, with, you, with your patients. And we know that there is a risk and there will be questions by other people, can I use some of your medication? So be open about it. And, but more important, I think we go to higher doses and we, we are aware that we have to look at uh, uh, cardiovascular risks. And in some patients we see increase of blood pressure or heart frequency that we don't really like. And so we add some propnerol in these patients, and, and they're doing fine. So it, it, you need to be aware of it, but you have to treat it and to do like you would do with any other patients, titrate to a level that you still have improvement of behavior without having more side effects than, than gains. And finally, of course, uh, most studies with high doses have been done in patients with uh, stimulant uh, addiction. Now, this medication might be the same as for treating of the stimulant medication. It would be a substitution treatment. There's at least one study, the study from Sweden, that shows it's not only substituting for, in that case, it was uh, amphetamine uh, addiction. You saw, indeed, a reduction of ADHD symptoms and reduction on, of amphetamine use in these patients uh, with higher dosage of methylphenol. But you saw also a reduction of other addictive drugs. So it seems to do a little bit more than that. And finally, if you are dealing with patients with other addictions, like for example, alcohol, don't hesitate to start treating the alcohol uh, uh, use disorder at the same time with motivational interview, with cognitive behavior, but if needed also with medications that, that you can use. And uh, finally, with, with regard to diagnosis, I think we did some studies and there is a tendency that you postpone the diagnosis of ADHD until people uh, are stabilizing with regard to their alcohol or drug use. We don't think that's needed. Actually, you can screen patients whenever they come in, and uh, if they're screen positive, they're m very likely to also be screen positive if they're stabilized. So use this immediate screening. And of course, if you have a positive screen, you have to confirm that, that suspicion by a good diagnostic interview on ADHD. But uh, I wouldn't spend too much time on waiting till your patient is becoming accident. It might never happen. And if you can start your treatment of the ADHD, you might be able to reach stabilization of use and, stabiliz and, and reduction of, uh, of substance use. I hope that, that uh, Maurice agrees with it. Oh, yeah, completely. Well, I think we have uh, effect on ADHD. We definitely use uh, long-acting uh, dexamphetamine in the treatment of cocaine-dependent patients. And actually, we did some studies on uh, patients that it were dependent on uh, heroin and, and cocaine. And they did very well, actually, on long-acting uh, uh, dexamphetamine, pretty high dosages, or as the Americans say, they don't say high, they never do that. So they say robust doses. Uh, so we used robust doses, which means uh, 60 to 80 milligrams of uh, dexamphetamine, slow release. I don't know whether it's available in France. It's not available in all European countries. Uh, because there's indication that the immediate release uh, dexamphetamine is actually not very useful in the treatment of cocaine dependence. And at least there is one study by uh, Francis Levin showing that uh, in, the, in their patients with ADHD and cocaine dependence, uh, 60 milligram was the best for the treatment of the ADHD symptoms, whereas the 80 milligrams was the best for the treatment of the, the cocaine dependence. What it means to me is that you don't have to go for 60 or 80, but there's different patients who respond different to different uh, dosages. And so with your patients, you have to find if they have ADHD and cocaine use disorder, long acting uh, uh, dexamphetamine, find a dose, uh, at least you have some support from the literature up to 80 milligrams, which is not, it, it's not a low dose, 80 milligrams of dexamphetamine. So uh, that's what I would do. Uh, and of course, it doesn't work with all patients, but I think you have a very serious uh, probability that you have success with, uh, with some of your patients. Thank you. Uh,
Enjoy your cup of coffee and we'll uh, be back here at uh, 4.30.